um, I'm Tom Meixner. I'm the chair of uh, the Cienega Watershed Partnership. I'll put our webpage link um, down in the chat. Um, and today we have Michael Bogan, who's a professor here at the University of Arizona, um, aquatic and vertebrate ecologist, sometimes dabbles in fish and frogs. Um, you know, Michael got his PhD at Oregon State. Um, um, and apparently he visited Southern Arizona so much, he decided that when the position opened up here at the U of A, he wanted to come. And we're very thankful to have him because um, he's really energetic. If you don't follow, if you're not on Twitter, uh, Michael might be one of the reasons to join. Um, although his recently graduated PhD student, Aaron McGee, AKA Afro Herper might be an even better reason. And today is Wednesday. If you're not familiar, today is Find That Lizard Day. So um, I'll, I'll put a link to Aaron's uh, Twitter feed in the chat just so you can see. But, but Michael does a lot of work on the Santa Cruz with the Heritage Project all around Southern Arizona with um, aquatic habitats and more widely than that. Um, um, and so um, he got his PhD back in 12. He was hired here at U of A in 2017. In between, he worked at Berkeley. Um, but uh, a lot of experience in sort of dry land, inter ephemeral to intermittent to perennial um, aquatic uh, uh, invertebrate biodiversity. And today he'll be talking about that in, in the context of the Santa Creek Basin. So with no further ado, go ahead, Michael. All right, thanks, Tom. Thanks for the, the invitation. Um, and what, what Tom didn't tell you is that this is this is the only academic job I applied for. So Tucson was the only place I wanted to end up. And and I was coming down here whether I got this job or not. So I'm just happy that I that I have the job while I'm here. Well, I think we're we're very happy to have you. I'll speak for my <laughs> U of A colleagues. So and I think the community of Southern Arizona should be very thankful to have you because I think the expertise you bring uh, on in, in aquatic invertebrates and aquatic ecology is sort of was a missing piece here at the U and in Southern Arizona. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative to have that opportunity. Um, so this, this was really fun for me today because Cienega Creek, the, you know, obviously I, I work a lot in the Santa Cruz river itself. And so that's in the, the Cienega Creek is part of the greater basin. Um, but I have done a kind of a number of, of smaller studies over the years in different parts of the Cienega Creek basin. Um, so what I'm going to try to do today is, is kind of weave some different little stories together about the work that I've done in the basin from 2003 until, you know, until this year um, and talk about some of the, the flow dynamics that we see across the basin that a lot of you are familiar with um, and how those flow dynamics and the changes in those flow dynamics affect um, some of the aquatic invertebrates uh, that we see there and, and the biodiversity as a whole of, of aquatic invertebrates. So this is um, a scene of, of one of our favorite counties uh, owned spots in Cienega Creek that, that I'm sure most people recognize um, and some of the aquatic invertebrates that you can find in that uh, reach of Cienega Creek. So I think for this audience, um, I probably don't have to to convince you that aquatic invertebrates are important, but I'll start out with that argument anyway. Um, this is from a, a great uh, review paper that came out uh, about 15 years ago, basically looking at all the different ways that aquatic invertebrates play a, a real key role in linking different parts of riparian food webs. Um, and that is through their two phase lifestyle or life uh, cycle, so that they're in the water for uh, the majority of their life as larvae. And then the majority of those species will emerge into the terrestrial environment for their adult stage where they mate and lay eggs and sometimes disperse from one water body to another. Um, and that's really the key uh, component of their life cycle there. Because when they're in the aquatic stage, they're eating algae, they're eating the cottonwood leaves that fall into the creeks, um, consuming that material. But when they emerge out into that terrestrial stage, they're basically making all of that energy in the algae and the leaves available to things like birds, bats, uh, terrestrial predators like spiders, um, and, and even lizards. As Tom mentioned, um, one of my past students, Aaron McGee, studied lizards and, and how they're connected to this emergence of aquatic uh, insects from, from our local streams. So they're small, they're hard to see, but there are, um, they are really, really important in a lot of different um, ecological realms. I always try to make the argument that we're lucky locally that we've got a really charismatic microfauna of aquatic invertebrates as well. 
So it's harder when you work in a big muddy river system like the Mississippi to show off aquatic invertebrates. But here you can go to the edge of Scanaga Creek or any of its uh, tributaries, look into a stream pool and see lots of really colorful and fun um, aquatic invertebrates. A lot of our, our beetles are really pretty. Um, this lower uh, right hand side here is the, the sunburst diving beetle. I think other than dragonflies, it's probably the only aquatic insect that's been featured on a US postal stamp. Um, otherwise, they don't usually get that kind of press. Um, but we've got a, a really wide variety of, of really interesting invertebrates, all of which have you know, <clears throat> distinct or unique um, attributes, behaviors, life cycles um, that are really well adapted to, to the dynamic nature of our streams. So we don't have an overall number. I couldn't tell you exactly how many aquatic invertebrates you could find in the Santa Cruz Creek watershed, but um, you know, at least 300, I think, would be a, a pretty conservative guess, um, and it could be it could be a good bit higher than that as well. Um, so what I want to do today is basically highlight that diversity um, and and show how both the diversity and the types of species we find in any given part of the watershed are shaped by the flow regimes there. So we're gonna we're gonna take a little bit of a tour through the watershed. Um, and start up in some of the headwater places I've worked, Gardner Canyon, and then kind of slowly make our way down through the watershed um, to some of those lower county owned properties um, and, and one of the lower tributaries here, Davidson Creek. And basically just see kind of what we find at each of these sites and what some of the factors are that are shaping the invertebrates that we see there. And feel free to use the chat or jump in anytime with questions if you have them. So if we start out at Gardner Canyon, it's, it's a pretty typical Sky Island stream, um, meaning that we've got some high elevation mountains up above it. You know, in this case, we've got Mount Wrightson here at, at 9,400 feet. And then where the stream bottom is, or the bottom of the canyon, where you usually find water, is usually between, you know, five and 7,000 feet elevation. And that's, that's really typical across all the Sky Islands to find water in those parts of the canyons. Um, so that water, of course, that we're getting in Gardner Canyon is coming from snow melt and coming from um, rainfall that's happening up on, on uh, the higher parts of the mountains. Let's see here. So if we look at what the flow regime looks like in those headwaters, those kind of montane headwater streams, um, this is this is what a, <laughs> kind of what the flow regime looked like when I started my work down here in 2000s, the early 2000s. Um, where we would see kind of a, a pronounced uh, high base flow period during the winter time. And that's from that winter rainfall or from that snow melt. Um, as, as Tom and a lot of you know, in recent years, we, <laughs> we have not been seeing that aspect of the, the hydrograph very often. Um, and then the rest of the year, we would see kind of low base flow or no base flow in the stream, um, punctuated, of course, by our monsoon season. And, and as a lot of you know, if we get a really good monsoon season or some of those tropical rains, we may pick up the base flow in those streams for a little while, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't contribute to base flow as much as those winter rains and, and snow melt do. Um, so we can kind of divide the year into these two different components. And when we start to think about what life is like in the stream during those seasons, one aspect we can look at that's really influential for the aquatic invertebrates is temperature. Um, and so this is not from Gardner, but it's from Florida. So a nearby stream has a very similar temperature regime that, um, that Gardner has. And if we overlay those flow seasons, what we'll see is that during that high base flow in the winter time, the snow melt, obviously number one, water temperatures stay pretty cool, which is not a surprise. But one of the key features here is that they stay pretty consistent day to day and week to week. So there's not wide dramatic swings in water temperatures. And so there's a whole suite of organisms that really like those kinds of conditions. But then the rest of the year, especially you know, summer and into early fall, um, depending on what the floods are happening, depending on, on how much water there is in the system, the, the water temperature is really influenced by the air temperature. Um, and so you can see you know, temperatures here in the summertime in, in those streams like Gardner Basin, um, getting up as high as you know, 32 Celsius, which is, you know, I think, getting into the low 80s Fahrenheit, 83, 84. It's pretty warm for a lot of aquatic species. Um, so that's really going to shape what we see when we look into the stream itself. 
So here's from my early days of working in, in the basin. Um, this is my second summer of field work for my master's degree, which was also at Oregon State. Um, and this is uh, kind of a typical stream pool in Gardner Canyon at the tail end of that high base flow season um, when there's still some, some um, flow in the stream and the water temperatures are still pretty cool. But then as a lot of you know, when you go back to that exact same spot a couple months later, you know, that base flow is gone. We're into that early summer intense dry season and, and we call it the cook down where the pools have contracted and everything is, is concentrated. You know, everything that, that lives in the water is concentrated into these much smaller areas. Again, with higher temperatures and kind of more, more intense um, environmental conditions. So this, this was work that was part of Gardner Canyon was one of a number of studies, a number of uh, streams across the sky on, that we studied for, for my master's degree. Um, and we were interested in that shift between those two different flow conditions. What happens to the aquatic invertebrate communities during those high base flow conditions and then during the, the low flow conditions. And so what we see in Gardner Canyon and basically anywhere across the Sky Islands that has those high elevation kind of cold snowpack areas that contribute to flow is that during the low flow season, what you find in a place like Gardner Canyon is basically what we call the Madrean fauna. So it's a lot of those charismatic critters that I showed on the first couple slides, beetles, true bugs, our giant water bugs, um, back swimmers, water striders things that you could also find in a pond in a lot of places, um, but they're concentrated into those small pools. And if you were looking for cold water species, like kind of the traditional trout stream species, mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, you really have to go up to the springs that are way up high on Mount Wrightson or some of the other peaks in the Chiricahuas and other places. And that's during that low flow season, that's the only place you're gonna find them is in those high elevation springs. But, as soon as we have that winter runoff from either rainfall or snow melt, then what we see is basically that Madrean fauna kind of disappears. And we're not exactly sure where all those beetles and bugs go, but you can't find them in the streams anymore. So they've either been washed out or they've flown off to a pond or somewhere else to live that's more to their liking. And that Rocky Mountain fauna basically expands out of the headwaters and moves all the way down into the lower elevations. So suddenly you can find you know, basically trout stream type species down in this, these um, same areas where you had um, pond dwelling, warm water loving species uh, earlier in the season. And so we see this, this what we call a timeshare where places like, like Gardner Canyon switch between this Rocky Mountain fauna in the winter and then this Madrean fauna during the summer. So because you have that variation in flow, you're basically able to pack more species into the same site because you're having turnover, different types of species living in there in different seasons. Um, so overall, if we consider both that Rocky Mountain fauna and the Madrean fauna, in a place like Gardner Canyon, you know, we're likely to find 120, 140, sometimes even more um, species of aquatic invertebrates just, just in that little headwater section of, of our watershed. Um, so pretty diverse because of this, this switching back and forth between high flow and low flow conditions. And I think, you know, this is where it's really important to, to mention how critical these pools are during the low flow season. So, you know, somebody from back East or anyone else who's used to, to year round flowing streams, they might look at a pool like this and think that's, you know, that looks kind of scuzzy. That really doesn't look very, very, very good kind of habitat. Um, but, but it's critically important for species that are uh, relying on year round water. Um, and so one of the things we started to notice, you know, in the early stages of this now 20 plus year dry cycle that we're in, um, in that 99 to 2005 cycle, was that some of these formerly reliable pools in, in the Sky Islands were starting to dry up. And so nearby on the other side of the valley um, from from the Santa Rita's over in the Whetstone Mountains. We happened to be studying another place called French Joe Canyon, um, which was, was typical, just like Gardner would go through these, these flow fluctuations, winter and summer. Um, and so during the summer, it would cook down to, you know, in this case, you know, like a three foot wide pool, and there'd be a series of three or four of these. And that's all there was for water that was reliable, but it was enough to support a whole lot of species. So, 
in early 2005, we started to notice that the pools, the levels in those pools started dropping. And we had never seen that happen before during the dry season. They'd been pretty stable. Um, and so we watched it all the way through until basically the, the hydrological bottom fell out of the stream. And whatever groundwater source was keeping those pools going um, had failed. And so that pool, the pools dried up. Um, and what we saw was basically the loss of a whole group of organisms out of that stream, especially things like um, this giant water bug, Abetus herberdi, which is a flightless species. So it couldn't fly away to look for some other habitat. It was basically stuck there and, it, and it, you know, that population perished. Um, and other things like this big caddis fly that um, although they can fly in their adult stage, they're not prone to flying very long distances. And so local populations can disappear um, fairly easily when, when conditions change like this. And so we continued to track French Joe Canyon for many years. I think the last time I went out there was 2016 or 2017. And whenever the water came back, when it would have seasonal water, seasonal pool water in those pools, none of these species that we saw extirpated ever were able to recolonize. So we think it's kind of a permanent shift once these perennial pools disappear. So that's something I haven't been back to, to Gardner in, in probably at least six or seven years, but um, I think early this summer, I'm going to try to get out there and see how some of those formerly reliable pools um, are looking. So that's basically what's describing what's going on in these parts of the watershed that have high elevation um, headwaters where there's um, snow melt or good rainfall coming in to recharge. But as we know, there's a lot of places that don't have those high elevation headwaters. They don't have snow melt contributing to them. And you know, as a result, they don't have any real reliable perennial water, but they do have seasonally intermittent flowing water. So the next little stop we're gonna take here is at Cave Creek, which is a tributary real close to Gardner, but it's not draining Mount Wrights and it's not draining the highest parts of the, the Santa Rita's. And so it has a different flow regime. It looks really nice during the winter um, when we've had good amounts of rainfall, um, but this is from um, Cave Creek itself is engaged, but this is a very similar flow regime from Banning Creek uh, over by Bisbee. And what you can see here are these periods of base flow when uh, it's flowing during these, these intermittent flow periods and then long dry periods, sometimes over a year in between. Um, so it's a pretty typical intermittent stream in, in the Sky Islands. So if we go out and we sample Cave Creek, we're not going to see that Rocky Mountain fauna. We're not going to see those, those giant water bugs and things that need those perennial pools. And instead, we see a totally different fauna. Um, and this is a fauna that's really adapted to those, those intermittent flow conditions and that periodic drying. Um, and that's primarily uh, one really tough species of stonefly. Uh, some black flies, um, some midges. These are, are non-biting midges. Um, and then there's one other species, a Dobson fly, that can tolerate these really long dry periods. Um, so there's not a real diverse fauna in, in these intermittent tributaries to Sienega Creek, um, but it's a really specialized, really tough fauna. Um, some of the tributaries we've seen go dry for multiple years in a row. And then as soon as we get a good winter and that flow comes back, you go there, you know, five weeks after the flow is resumed, and it's filled with millions and millions of individuals of these species. So they're able to come back really well. Um, so this is a pattern we looked at both in the Sienega Creek watershed and, and on the other side of the hill um, over in the San Pedro watershed. And that was part of my, my PhD work down here as well. So I want to, you know, we'd, <clears throat> we really didn't know how these species survived, how they did that. Um, and so one species in particular seemed like it would be easier to study, this Arizona snowfly, this, this specialized um, stonefly. And as folks who've known me a while will know, I got, I got really obsessed with this species for about 10 years, trying to figure out how in the hell it survives in these streams that can be dry for five years in a row. And then you come back in the sixth year and there's these stoneflies everywhere. Um, so, uh, over a period of 10 years or so, it gathered information on the species to figure out how it did that. So when it was first described in the late 60s, it was thought to be endemic to Arizona, and it was thought to be really rare because it was only known from six locations. 
Um, in winter of 2005, we started finding it in the Dragoon Mountains and a few other places, and that really gave us a clue that it might be more widespread. Um, so we went out then the next really good winter, which was 2010, and just went to as many intermittent streams as we could find. And it turns out this thing is probably one of the most common aquatic insects anywhere in Arizona. Um, and it's found in New Mexico. And then we even found it in California as well. Um, but it's almost exclusively 99% of the sites that it lives in are intermittent and are dry for you know, six months or more each year. So it's really a specialist to these types of streams. So after I finished my PhD, I was living in Southern Arizona for a little bit before I started my postdoc. And it gave me an opportunity to kind of intensively study one population um, of this this species at Bear Canyon, the tributary to Sabino. Um, so I went out all winter long in winter of 2012, 2013. You could see Bear Canyon was dry as it normally is through the fall. And then we got a good winter storm, brought up that base flow. Uh, we see actually a, a fun rain on snow event that happened in late January of that year, caused a little bit of a flood um, and then a slow decline after those winter rains and snows um, wore off. So what I did is just go out every two weeks and looked for these things and tried to quantify them, figure out where they were, how abundant they were, what size they were, when they were in that adult stage. Um, and this is what I found. So the stream was dry. And almost immediately after the stream starts flowing, you could find these in small abundances. And within a couple of weeks, they are completely covering the stream bed. Like they are everywhere, these, these um, larvae of the species. You'll see here um, rapid recovery from drought. And then there was that rain on snow event. So it caused a little bit of a decline in their population, but they popped back up again after the flood. They were resilient. And then they almost disappeared in late spring and their numbers popped back up a little bit and then dropped back down and they were completely gone well before the stream dried up again at the end of the spring, early summer. Um, so what I was really interested in then is what size were these? How were they growing? Where was the, what was their life stage? Um, so this came to be the, the most tedious part. <laughs> so for each of those individual stoneflies that I collected, I went and measured the width of their heads. And the stoneflies themselves are only about that big. So if you can imagine measuring a head width, but that gives you a proxy for the size of these things. Um, and so what we're seeing on this plot is basically the abundance or the proportion of all the individuals I collected at a given head width. And so here we are, zero days, the flow starts up. Two weeks after flow resumes, you can see most of the individuals are at the smaller size. And then as we go on through the weeks of collection, the individuals are growing bigger and bigger and bigger until this point when they're at their maximum size. Um, so what this is showing us is that when that flow resumes, there's a single cohort of these things that are growing quickly through time, developing in a matter of six weeks, which is really fast for a stonefly. And then in those later weeks there, they're coming out into that adult stage and they're looking for mates and they're laying eggs in the stream. And so then right after that, we start to see these, the tiniest, tiniest stoneflies you could possibly imagine <laughs> for a couple of weeks, which are those eggs that have hatched from the adults that mated and laid eggs. And then the larvae disappear, as I mentioned, and they're gone well before the ripples dry up or before the entire stream dries up. And so what we, think that they're doing is as soon as those eggs hatch, then those tiny little larvae, they hang out for a little bit in the stream, and then they immediately go down into the stream bed and they prepare for a larval dormancy. Um, we were not able to actually find any of the dormant individuals. They're deeper than we could dig in the stream bed. <laughs> um, and we think that's because in between these favorable winter seasons, there are monsoon floods that might damage the the dormant larvae. Um, and so they go somewhere down deep enough that they're deep below the, the stream bed. Um, and then they wait and they wait until surface flow comes back. And it might be the next winter. It might be two years, three years, four years, five years. And then they resume their growth and immediately start going again. So this is just one species, one example of dealing with stream drying and intermittency. But there are you know, 25 or 30 other species that co-occur 
with the stonefly, um, and we don't know how they do it. It might be something similar, or they might have a different strategy. So that was a little window into my world of, of stonefly, intermittent stream stonefly obsession. Um, and some folks on the call, I know I've talked to Julia about it, I've talked to, to several folks about it. It's a, a species I could talk about all day. Um, but we'll move on to the next part of the tour <laughs> to a very different environment. Um, this is one I haven't worked at very much, just a single visit back in 2004, uh, Empire Gulch. And so totally different habitat, right? Stable, Cienega, spring fed, year round temperatures stay the same. Um, because of the stability and the lack of flow, there's relatively low dissolved oxygen in there. It's not as diverse as you would think, given, um, given the stability of the flow and the water being there year round. We found about 50 species there um, in our, our surveys at, at uh, Empire Ranch. Um, but we did find some interesting dynamics of some of the species that do live there. Um, so the same giant water bug that lives up in Gardner Canyon that we saw um, be extirpated from French Joe Canyon, this flightless giant water bug, the Vetus herberdi, has a very different life cycle in the Cienega style habitat than it does in Gardner Canyon, even though they're just a few miles apart from one another. Um, so this is from, from a, a, a friend's uh, master's thesis in the lab I came out of at Oregon State, Arlo Pellegrin. And basically he studied the size and the development and the growth of these giant water bugs in Cienega habitats, including at, at Empire Ranch and in mountain stream habitats. And what he found is that even though it's the exact same species, they look very different whether you catch them in a Cienega or you catch them in a mountain stream. And so in the mountain streams, the species is actually bigger because they grow slower and they grow through that entire year. So they wait out, you know, they grow really slowly through that cold water season in the winter time, and then they start growing faster in the warm water season in the early summer, but they have slow continuous growth uh, throughout the year. Whereas the ones living in the Cienega grow quickly to a small size, and then they mature and reproduce in just a few months rather than doing it over the course of an entire year. And that's because the water temperature is stable, it's relatively warm. And so they're able to kind of go through their life cycle quickly. But as a result, they end up as much smaller size bugs than you would see in Gardner Canyon. Um, and Arlo even took some of these bugs all the way back to Oregon State from Empire Gulch from Gardner Canyon, raised them in the lab and found that it was basically a fixed genetic trait, you know, that they are, are adapted to that exact temperature regime in those habitats. So it's really interesting. It's not something that from a bio biodiversity perspective you would see on the surface if you're just going there and counting the number of species, um, but it's an example of how the flow regimes can shape the life history and the, the behavior and the generation times, all these different aspects of, a, of an organism's life between um, a, a variable flow regime habitat and a stable flow regime habitat. So we're gonna move downstream now quite a ways. And at the end, I'll mention that there's, there's a whole lot in here that I'm skipping <laughs> because I haven't worked as much in this part, even though there's, there's a lot of great habitat in there. But we're gonna jump all the way down here to Cienega Creek uh, at Horseshoe Bend, which is another spot that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And here we've got Julia and Ian from the county. Um, this was about a couple, couple summers ago that we were out there. Um, and this is a cool site because it's kind of a combination. It's got some of those Cienega-like features, right? There's a lot of uh, aquatic plant growth. There's a, a stable flow there, but it's also in the active stream channel. So it experiences large floods. Um, so it has a lot of, of dynamic uh, flow regime changes depending on the season and the year type. Um, this was at the end of a, of a pretty dry year. And so that vegetation had grown in quite a bit, but then you get some big floods and it will open wide up again and, and be a totally different looking habitat. Um, some of the charismatic species that we can find here, they're not aquatic invertebrates, but leopard frogs are always uh, have a special place in my heart. Um, so this was a leopard frog from, from our visit there in, in 2020 with Julia and Ian. Um, the dragonflies, as some of you know, are, are very close to my heart. So it's a great spot to go for, 
for dragonfly watching. Uh, this is a flame skimmer dragonfly. Uh, one of our largest damselflies uh, that we found there during our surveys. Uh, this is a, a, um, a, a giant spread wing damselfly. It's basically the size of a dragonfly, but with the body of a, of a damselfly. Um, and then one of our more beautiful dragon uh, damselflies that you really only find in these spring-fed stable habitats, um, the, the painted damsel, damselfly. Um, so as I mentioned, this is cool because it has a little bit of, of everything. It's kind of a Goldilocks place, right? Reliable base flow, but we do have floods. It, it is dynamic. It changes through time. There's going to be turnover. Um, and this is a spot that, that I wish I had a lot more data from, but we just have have a, a one season of, of sampling there. Um, so there's likely well over 100 species that are found um, at this site. And I think with repeated sampling, we would find more and more there because it is, it is such a variable dynamic place. Um, and there are some really cool species there. One thing, you know, after 19 years of surveying streams in the area, it's, it's rare that I find something I haven't seen before. Um, but when we were out there on this trip in, in uh, 2020, I did find in a, in a species of aquatic caterpillar that I had never seen in the last 19 years. Um, and it's one that only lives on the submerged aquatic vegetation that you see here, and it eats that submerged aquatic vegetation. So it's something that's more common you know, further east and in wetter places, um, but it was really fun to find that at, at Sienega Creek at Horseshoe Bend. So I think repeated sampling there would definitely reveal a lot of cool stuff. So we're going to go just a little bit further downstream from there to a site we've looked at more. Um, that's Sienega Creek at Trestles or at the, um, the railroad bridge and the, the road bridge that we can see here in the background. Um, and so this is a little bit less lush than it is at Horseshoe. I think the, you know, the flow is less stable here. It, it dries seasonally, but the pools will persist at least. Um, and so we, <clears throat> it almost starts to look like Gardner Canyon where we've got uh, that madrain fauna during the dry season when it's contracted down to pools, tons of giant water bugs and, and diving beetles and water striders and things like that. <clears throat> but if you go there in the winter time during the high flow season, there are um, some different species of stone flies you can find there, a lot of mayflies, black flies, things that you would typically find in running water habitat. Um, so it's, it's a really cool spot, really dynamic, um, but because of that, bound bedrock nature of it too, the floods can be pretty intense here. And so depending on when you sample, you may see you know, really diverse aquatic invertebrate fauna, or you may see almost nothing <laughs> if you go in after one of these big uh, floods or, or really intense drying events. And I'll show a graph in just a minute that demonstrates that. Um, so we're going to tie these last two sites together. That's Trestles right there. And then we're going to move up from Trestles a little ways up Davidson Canyon. Um, and so this is a, a project that we started in, in 2018 with uh, Julia and others from the county. And we had hoped <laughs> to be able to document the diversity of aquatic invertebrates in Davidson Canyon and how they change through the seasons. Um, and as, as a lot of folks will know, when we started this, there was water there in, in April of 2018, the first visit out there to start this, these surveys. Uh, and then basically almost every visit after that for the next two years, there was no water in Davidson Canyon. It was a really, really rough spell for Davidson Canyon. Um, so we weren't able to document quite as much of the diversity as we had hoped for uh, from this site. But I've been, I've been watching the, the emails about the, the flow monitoring coming in from the county. And it sounds like Davidson's had flow for quite a while now, and it probably will for quite a while. So I think, Julia, we should chat about getting back out there and taking a look and seeing what's in there. Just an example of how little water there was. Uh, this is up above the freeway. So when the first time we visited in April 2018, it looked pretty good, flowing water in several stretches. And then we came back in July, there was very little water. April of next year, very little water. April of 2020, very little water. So we basically collected samples where we could um, to see what we were finding in those sites in Davidson Canyon. Um, and we managed to find at least 75 species, so not too bad, despite those really rough conditions. 
but we know that as, as recently as the late 90s, you know, that was basically a reliably perennial site. And there were things like, like long fin dace and leopard frogs and giant water bugs there. Um, so it's obvious that Davidson has been, been going through a, a tough spell these last couple of decades uh, that we've been in this intense dry period. Um, so this is the one data graph you'll see. So showing some of what we were finding from Davidson Canyon and Cienega Creek. Um, and so here's those three times we were able to sample Davidson Canyon. And what we're seeing on the, the y-axis here is basically what the state uses um, to determine the, the biological value or the biological integrity of a warm water stream, which is what Davidson and Cienega would be um, considered. And this is a, an index that's calculated for perennial sites. So you have to keep that in mind when you're looking at this. So not surprisingly, Davidson Canyon, the three times we were able to sample it, kind of looks low. <laughs> it, it would show up as, as being impaired uh, as the state would consider it, but that's because it had gone through these dry spells. Um, and so they don't have a metric that is meant for an intermittent site. It would obviously have scored much higher if there was a metric for an intermittent site. Um, Cienega Creek at Trestles, when we started out, it did really well. Um, it was in the high category for the state. Um, then we had some really large floods that came through right before September sampling, which knocked the value back down. But you know, desert stream critters are resilient. And by April, they had bounced back up again. But then we get into that really dry spell in April of 2020, and it was impaired again at that point in time. Um, and here's just the one time we were able to go to Horseshoe Bend, and, and that site looked great as far as you know, state monitoring standards would go. So obviously I've missed a big important part of the watershed, <laughs> um, especially if there's anyone who studies fish or frogs, like that's the, what, what some people would argue the heart of Cienega Creek watershed and for whatever logistical and, and uh, fate reason, I have not done any sampling in that area. Um, so there's, I'm sure, a lot of hidden diversity in that area. A lot of things, are, I've seen photos of the habitat, I've visited different parts of it. So I, I can guarantee you there's some stuff in there that we haven't seen at these other six sites. Um, so that would, be, that would be really cool to, to do some more exploring and see what invertebrate stories we can tell in that area. So to summarize across all these six sites that, that we've done some work in over the years, we've seen you know, at least 300 species of aquatic invertebrates. There's probably more, especially given that, that central part of the main stem that we haven't looked at. Um, and hopefully by now you can, you can um, guess that the diversity and the types of species that we see across the basin uh, vary really widely depending on what the exact local flow regime is. You know, and in general, shorter periods of flow will reduce the diversity of species, which is pretty intuitive. Um, but the neat part is in streams that are supposed to have short flow periods, you know, that have a long history of that, there's a really specialized fauna that have figured out how to live in those conditions. Um, so surveys in the main stem and then any of the eastern springs along the edge of the Whetstone Mountains um, would certainly increase our, our knowledge and our estimate of, of the biodiversity of the basin. So I definitely want to thank Julia and Ian and Brian from uh, Pima County who have worked with at various points in time on, on this work. And thanks for the invitation, Tom. You're welcome, Michael. Are there, uh, nice talk, Michael, Re very enjoyable. Like I said, great pictures. And, and I, I guess I gained new insight, but are, do other folks have questions for, for Michael? Julia has one in the chat about what is the basis for the Abydus observation on Davidson? Yeah. Oops, I'm trying to open the chat up. I thought I had it open, but I guess I didn't. <laughs> what is the basis for the... Oh, you know, I'm trying to remember who that came from. That, that, I don't know if Dave Lytle had gone in there in the late 90s when he um, came down to U of A to do his postdoc. It might be that that's where it came from. I'd have to do a little digging, Julia, to, to give you the exact um, answer, but I will, I will try to dig that up and, and give you that. Um, I'm gonna see, what is the involvement of the county in this project? 
Um, so in the early days, I was working, you know, obviously on the mostly on the Forest Service lands or the the National um, Riparian Area um, in the Empire Ranch area. Um, so the the county wasn't involved in the early days, but then as soon as I started this job and and chatted more with with Julia and and Brian and other folks at the county, um, they were interested in in getting a little bit more information about Davidson and and Sienega Creek on the county properties. Um, so that was that was how we got involved with the county starting in in 2018. So I'll speak more about the hyperreic zone, which mesocapnia depends on. Do you expect much of a hyperreic zone on sand bed streams? So that's that's still a mystery. Um, we don't actually know that mesocapnia depends on the hyperreic zone. There are um, stonefly species that go into a larval dormancy like that, that are completely, um, uh, I can't remember what the technical word, it's like anhydrobiotic, but basically they desiccate and they dry up. So they, they are not staying active in the hyperreic zone. They're not um, alive individuals. They are completely dormant, dried up, almost like, like fairy shrimp. Um, so that is actually what I think is probably happening with mesocapnia because places we see them in high abundances like West Stronghold Canyon in the Dry Dunes, the, those are places that really don't have a hyperreic zone to speak of. You know, they have a very, very shallow um, subsurface zone and then it's, and then it's bedrock. Um, so I, I think they're actually going down and then going just deep enough to get out of that scour zone and then going into that desiccated state. Mm. And, then, and then when the water, so, and, and Bear Canyon is another good place, right? We know like lower Bear Canyon, we know the water table drops, you know, 10, 15 meters uh, from season to season at times. And there's no, other than uh, a few stoneflies in, in Montana, there's really no stoneflies that are known to track that far and go down into the hyperreic zone as well. Um, so I think basically across their distribution, they are going into that desiccated dormant stage somewhere down a few meters down into the stream bed. And then what tells them to come back to life is actually the rising water table during um, that next winter season. And so when that water table rises and intersects with where that dried up dormant larva is, that'll trigger rehydration. And then as the water table keeps rising, they'll follow that back up to the surface. So that's, that's what I actually think is happening. That's a hypothesis. Um, we, we dug the hell out of a few stream beds and rehydrated what felt like tons of sediment trying, trying to prove that. Um, but we, I think we couldn't dig deep enough to actually get down and find them. Um, and have you ever sampled in a shallow well near some of these streams to see if they're invertebrates? I haven't done that in, in Southern Arizona, but I think it would be fascinating. Um, there are, that is how some of the hyperreic stoneflies were discovered in Montana because they showed up in people's kitchen sinks because they had wells in the floodplain and they actually pulled uh, stoneflies into their well and into their water supply. And then they literally had stonefly larvae coming out of their sink. Um, so I would love to, to look in wells and get water samples out of wells. Um, there are good examples from Oregon and other places of new species of diving beetles being found that are only known from the aquifer, that are only known from subsurface water. Um, so there could be some really cool stuff in, in our stream, in our um, subsurface shallow groundwater as well. Hey, Michael. Yeah. Um, as part of the work that we've done with Jen McIntosh, we had grad students that went around door to door in Davidson Canyon and Lower Sienega Creek asking to borrow a cup of their well water. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, so Jen and others have that, you know, past landowner relation and maybe we can tap into yeah. that. Okay, great. And that was for stable isotopes, right? Yeah, natural tracers, including yes. stable isotopes. Yeah. Okay, yep. cool. Yeah, that would be super fun. And then Doug mentions in the chat the piezometers in La Cienegas mm -hmm. National Conservation Area. Yeah, that would be super cool too. So there's a, um, a question from Sheila McFarland. Have you or are you producing any species charts for the Cienega that could be used with school groups, right? Classes go out and groups go out. They look for bugs as part of the activities. And I, I guess Sheila's wondering, is there a specific ID guide available? Mm -hmm. or sort of a or short will term? there be? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, that's a great idea. We don't, we don't have one. We have some kind of the same generic ones that, you know, yeah. like the county uses for the Living River Project. You yeah. know, I, use, I use those with school groups too. Um, mm -hmm. But it would be, it would be really nice to have, especially because we know fairly well what's at a given site. We mm -hmm. could make a, a much more specialized focused one mm -hmm. for school groups, for sure. Mm -hmm. They often go to Empire Gulch. And of course, right now with the COVID situation, not a lot of activities going anywhere, but Empire Gulch was one of the main places where they would do a little dipping and then put them in the ice trays, you know, yeah. and look at the chart and uh, put their toes in to see if a toe biter would actually toe bite <laughs> their toe, which, you know, anyway, um, I was just thinking if there was a chart, it would help science teachers but then they might be able to help you by reporting the caterpillar or something you know right uh, anyway um, yeah that's a great yeah. idea yeah and that for something especially for empire gulch that'd be pretty easy because it's a mm -hmm. you know it's a relatively simple fauna there so we could yeah. we could come up with a really detailed guide that we would be, need could yeah need. yeah so michael i was wondering right you see these right the the relative flow permanence is obviously important because that affects whether insects are able to emerge to adult and get to mating stage. Yep. But I'm wondering about sort of the combination of time and space, how extensive those areas need to be in order to have a significant, significant enough community. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's how big do things have to be. I'm just thinking about sort of flow permanent studies that the county and BLM have been doing for years. And I know like this year on Davidson, because of last summer, it seems that there's much more flow than there was previously so yeah yeah i mean we've you know just kind of thinking across the whole sky islands and the range of streams anything on the scale of you know 50 meters 150 feet if you've got that much habitat then you've got a pretty good chance of having you know a, a full fauna or an almost okay. complete fauna yeah when it when it starts to get smaller we've especially seen this in the galliura mountains um places on the east side of the Galliero Mountains, like Ash Creek and High Creek, when it starts to really contract down to the point where you have like three pools left during the dry season and nothing yeah. else, then, you know, your giant water bugs will hang on a few things, but you'll lose just because there's so much competition yeah. and things are so crammed in that you do lose a good part of the fauna. Well, and, and sort of going back to Julia's question about the, for the mesocapnia, the, the hyperreic zone, I'm wondering about right, the relevance of sort of shallow groundwater to sustaining these communities, even when there's not surface water present. But if you get, like along Davidson, I assume oftentimes there is the shallow groundwater that's present, but it's just, it's, it's not exposed. Like how, is that a habitat for a subset of species or? That's exactly it. Yeah, we haven't looked at that in our region, but it has been looked at in a number of places, even like in the UK. Um, and if, if that, subsurface water is relatively close to the surface within 30 centimeters of the surface then it can serve as a refuge for yeah. for at least a good subset of the fauna it won't work for everybody you know yeah. the giant water bugs they're they're amazing but they're not digging holes in the stream right, right? Um, but if you're a tiny little mayfly you can get down in the interstitial spaces between the gravel and the rocks yeah and you can actually persist in that shallow groundwater for for a few uh, months yeah and that sheds some light i think on and some of the sort of hydrologic management or water management things that could be related and certainly climate change. On a different note, I'm wondering about, are there interactions with things like crawfish and bullfrogs and, and maybe non-native fish and how they affect the, the insect, you know, the, the insect biodiversity and assemblage? Yeah, certainly all of those things do, each of those species do affect the assemblage. Um, a lot of that is, is the, the impact scales with the size of the habitat in a lot of ways and the complexity of the habitat. And so a place like Garden or Canyon, you know, where it gets down to those pools, in places we've seen crayfish get into those kind of habitats. I'm thinking of Bear Canyon on the south side of the Huachucas. Um, crayfish got in there and it's a similar bedrock pool kind of habitat. And there is nothing but crayfish. Like they obliterate everything else. Right? Okay. But in a place like the Santa Cruz or even the main stem of Cienega, there's enough refuge and there's enough kind of complexity and habitat that a lot of the species can hide from the crayfish. They don't have the same intensity of impact. They still are having a negative impact, but not right. 
as bad as when they're crammed in together. And the same would go for both. You know, bullfrogs in a pond have a massive impact, um, but in a fl stream that floods all the time, that kind of dilutes their impact. Right. Okay. Cool. Are there any other questions for for Michael? Well, let's thank him again. Um, thanks, Michael. Uh, I'll note, you know, the, the, the series continues this spring. Uh, next month, four weeks from today, March 2nd, um, uh, Mary Nichols from the ARS is going to be talking about sort of the hydrologic and, um, and erosion manipulations that historical ranching and continue to have with erosion control structures here in southern Arizona. So um, see you all then. And, and we have Julia in April, so with Ian. So that's a good combo right there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all and have a good day. Okay.